welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the 33rd episode of The Simple Sophisticate. Today, we are going to talk about how to live alone well. And while I know not everyone wants to live alone, there are many of us out there who secretly would crave to live alone. And there are others of us, including myself, who are doing it and loving it. So today I'd like to share my own experience, but also some statistics from research done that demonstrate how wonderful this time of our lives can be. And a lot of it has to do with our mindset, but I also have some very specific tips and ways that you can revel in it. I want to begin with a quote by Phyllis Hope. She says, living alone affords an unparalleled opportunity to know yourself, to be yourself, and to develop yourself as a unique and interesting individual. And no doubt, guys, we are all unique and certainly interesting individuals if we just take the time to find that within ourselves. Let's start with some interesting statistics. In Stockholm, Sweden, 60% of all dwellings are occupied by a single individual. 60%! In Eric Kleinenberg's book, Going Solo, that was a bestseller in 2013 and continues to be a source for this idea of living alone and why it's so popular or becoming more popular in our modern culture. He speaks about these statistics and the one I just mentioned from from Stockholm, Sweden, but also interesting to note that Denmark, Finland, and Norway, as well as Sweden, they each sport, each of these countries sport 40 to 45% single occupancy within all dwellings. When Japan is a close fifth with 30%, we in the United States, if you're from the United States, tote a 28% of single dwellers. Now that's actually an increase, a significant increase from where it's been in the past. But it's interesting to point out or to discover, I should say, how many people are finding this way of life to be a way that works. And now not everyone in those situations is going to forever remain living by themselves, but a lot of them are. A lot of them are. So living alone, whether you're single, divorced, or widowed, is certainly something to be reveled in rather than feared. While admittedly, depending upon our personalities, I think if you're more extroverted, more more people that are extroverted tend to want people around them because that is what fuels them. But if you're more introverted, you or your creative type where you need to have a lot of time alone, you may be more prone to prefer to live alone, especially during certain periods of your life. Well, even if you don't want to live by yourself your entire life, I highly recommend tapping into it at some point in your life because each of us can benefit from living alone at some point. Why? Well, I'm going to go in today's episode into 16 different specific ways you can benefit. A crucial component to living a simply luxurious life is discovering who we are, what makes us tick, what makes us shine, and what nurtures us to become our best selves. Speaking from my own experience of living alone by choice for the past 13 years, it was the fact that I was living alone that I was able to discover things about myself that I don't know if I would have discovered them had I had a roommate or lived with a significant other, especially at that particular point in my life where I was still involved with a lot of insecurities, trying to figure some things out. I don't think I would have discovered as quickly that I was an introvert. I don't think I would have discovered and dived, felt comfortable enough to dive into my passion for writing. And there's so many other things and interests that my younger, less secure self would have never dared to pursue if I was trying to please a roommate or a significant other. Now, could I, do I want to live with another person now? Now that I've found that security, that sense of self, that confidence, 
to answer the first question, I am confident that I am better equipped to live well with another individual as I am now more capable of knowing what I need and realizing what I can compromise on. I am also able to advocate for myself so that I can balance relationships with my passion and not allow them to be pushed aside to please. To answer the second question, it depends on the person. I must admit, it's pretty amazing living by yourself. In 2012, I shared on the blog, The Simply Luxurious Life, 10 Benefits of Living Alone, of which many I will include in today's episode. But today, I'm going to go a little deeper. And on this week's episode of the podcast, I will share my own experiences as well. The intriguing fact when it comes to living alone is that many assume that it shouldn't be a permanent way of living, rather a mere transitional phase. And while this will most certainly be the case for some, Many more unapologetically choose to live alone as it is the most restorative, ideal way of experiencing life for them. In Kate Bullock's new book, which I will be reviewing later this month called Spinster Making a Life of One's Own, she makes a valid point about the societal expectations that can bend our mind one way or another simply to maintain the status quo. And she writes, how difficult it is to detach ourselves from the mass emotions and social conditions of the age we're born into. Of all of us, male and female, are part of the great comforting illusions and part illusions which every society uses to keep up its confidence in itself. Now within that quote, she pulled specifically from Doris Lessing's lecture series called Prisons We Choose to Live Inside. Now, I want to dispel any myths about living alone. As with anything that is new or different, if we haven't done it, it will take time to do it well. If you aren't used to living alone, coming home to an empty house or being left to your own devices to entertain yourself, this can be difficult at first. Anything of great value takes time to appreciate and emerge to reveal its true greatness. And living alone is no exception. From my own experience, the first time I lived alone was during college in the summer when my roommate left to go back home to live with her family and I stayed to work. It was really difficult. Nights especially, my brain would just go crazy. And that's one of the things we'll talk about is necessity. We have to master our minds. But it took time. I mean, I had never lived by myself before. It was brand new. But come my graduate year, after I had lived by myself off and on with roommates for a couple years, I wanted to be by myself. I couldn't wait to live by myself. I had figured it out and I became very comfortable with it, more comfortable than living with roommates. So that's something to keep in mind. It does take time, even for those of us that it's going to be innate. It's going to be a preferred. It will take time to figure out how. And hopefully with today's 16 tips, it'll get easier that much quicker. So today, I'd like to set you free. Admittedly, it took some time for me to proudly say I thoroughly enjoy living by myself because even though I knew it for quite some time, many of those people around me could not fathom it. They could not understand it. But it had always been true for me, I think. It's always been part of my being. I was always a kid who could entertain themselves, didn't need a friend to be there to entertain me. I always had ideas bouncing around in my head and I was always hiking or hanging out with my animals. That was just who I was. That was just who I was. And if you too are someone who revels in regular time to be by yourself or perhaps are living alone trying to figure out how to do it, today's post is something I think you're going to enjoy. So let's get started. So how to live alone well. Number one is to appreciate, relax, and enjoy it. Paul Newman reminds us that you only grow when you are alone. Yes, it may not be something you chose initially, or maybe it was, but it's not initially what you had expected. First, just simply take a breath. As I said, this is going to take time. The experience will be what you make it, and it all comes down to appreciating that time and space in solitude to do those things that you would not be able to do if someone or multiple someones were sharing the same space. Here are just a few perks to appreciate every day. 
When you leave your house or apartment, upon returning, hello, the house will be as you left it. Decisions don't need to be dependent on a compromise. You want risotto for dinner? Voila, that's what you're going to have. Sleeping straight through the night without interruptions, much more feasible. Having a quiet space to read, listen, or entertain whenever you want is always there. And decorating? Ho, ho, it's completely up to you. So have some fun. So number one, appreciate, relax, and enjoy. Number two, establish beloved rituals. Whether it's enjoying your favorite Paris tea each morning before you go to work, or looking forward to your weekly coffee chat with your close friend to catch up on each other's lives. Establish these rituals as a way to give yourself something to look forward to and savor each and every day because there is without question something to appreciate every day. We're alive to savor it. In today's show notes, I will share a link to a post I wrote a few years ago about the benefits of establishing daily rituals. And it'll go into much more detail than we talk about here today. As well, if you have the book, Choosing the Simply Luxurious Life, A Modern Woman's Guide, chapter eight is entirely dedicated to ideas on how to cultivate and establish simple rituals and pleasures into your everyday life. So do check it out. All right. So number two is establish beloved rituals. Number three is cultivate a healthy social circle. Kleinenberg points out that studies have actually revealed, surprisingly enough, that those who live alone are more socially involved and have a stronger social circle than those that cohabitate. Why? There is motivation and the removal of dependency on others in your home to entertain you. You are the one who has to reach out. You're the one doing the plan and you're the one getting out there. As we know, social media makes this much more viable as information of what to do and the capability of staying in touch is much easier than before. If you know you have plans to be with friends or family, this is, well, this is a thing that I really find absolutely blissful. So if you have plans to go meet your family and friends in the evening, and of course you want to go do that, you're really looking forward to it and you have a great time. The bliss moment is having a great experience with those people you love and care about. But then being able to come home to your own space and unwind and relax. It's a beautiful balance. It's one of those things I absolutely love about living alone. So number three, cultivate a healthy social circle. So you do have that time to interact and engage outside of work. So it is completely private and personal. But also, if you're someone who loves living by yourself, you have that as well. You have that as well. And you appreciate it even more when you have that balance. Number four, pay attention to your senses. I want to start off with a quote for this one by Henry David Thoreau. And he says, there can be no very black melancholy to him who lives in the midst of nature and has his senses still. I have never felt lonesome or in the least oppressed by a sense of solitude. When we start to realize and be aware of the world around us at any given moment. I think it's easy to quickly understand that we're really never alone. We're really never alone. Some prefer more human interaction, and I understand that, and that's totally understandable to, to, you know, include more of that in your life. But take in Mother Nature. Plant a garden. Care for something. Hang a bird feeder. Take care of your environment indoors and out. Pay attention to the colors in the room. They do affect your mood. Pay attention to the cleanliness. Pay attention to the outdoors as far as the weather. Savor those rainy days when they come. Come outside and revel in those days that are sunny. Make them moments. Enjoy the seasons changing. These are little rituals in and of themselves that can be something you can really appreciate, whoever you live with, but especially when you're on your own because you can figure out how you want to celebrate or enjoy them without paying mind to someone else's schedule. I love, one of the things I love is when it rains, I'll just go out and sit on my front porch with my dogs. And I just love listening to it. And I'll sit there sometimes with a book or sometimes nothing at all and just enjoy. And it's something simple and it sometimes lasts five minutes and sometimes 20. But I love this. I love it. Just this summer, or excuse me, just this last winter, 
one of the things I wrote in my resolutions for the year, my intentions, I should say, was to really enjoy nature even more. And a simple way I'm trying to do that is I want more birds around my house. And so as a gift for the holidays, I received a bird feeder. And it's taken my birds about two and a half, three months to find my bird feeder, but they're coming and I love it. It's been so much fun to watch them. And I look forward to hopefully getting a few more and um, just knowing that there's a safe place for them to come and eat food. So (laughs) just some examples of ways of being aware that you're never really alone if you pay attention to everything and you really listen and observe your senses, not just always what you see either, what you feel, what you smell, what you can touch. So number four, pay attention to your senses. Number five is enjoy this time of exploration because that's really what it is. Eugene Delacroix says, the things one experiences alone with oneself are much stronger and purer. You can freely dance with your own curiosities when you live alone. Are you curious about a new documentary? Watch it. Wish to try a rock climbing class? Do it. Listen to what piques your attention and explore it. Dance. Peek around that corner. Who knows what you will unearth? When we pay attention to what innately captures our attention and are not nudged by outside forces or peers, what we'll discover will take us closer toward reaching our true potential and finding our passions. Number six, create a sanctuary. This one's huge. This one's huge. Regardless of how big or small your space is, tending to your sanctuary is vital. And it's vital whether you live with someone or not, but especially when you live alone, I believe, because this is a place you are coming home to. No one's waiting for you. You're choosing to come home to this place. So you want to create a place that you want to come home to. Our home should be the place that restores us, comforts us, and allows us to rest so that we can be our best when we return to the world the next day. Consider your interior decor as an investment in your well-being. Number seven, master your mind. In episode 20 of The Simple Sophisticate, I shared 10 specific ways to do this. And while mastering your mind isn't exclusive to living alone, absolutely not. We all need to do it to find more contentment and peace within our lives. Accomplishing this feat, however, when we live by ourselves is vital to building the foundation of living well by ourselves. Because as I mentioned earlier in the episode about that whole, if we're not used to living alone, we can really let our, our, our mind just really takes over because it did for me. I, I completely can testify to that. Often when someone is living on their own for the first time, they've never had their mind all to themselves for such a long period of time. And as such, they can allow it to wander into places that are destructive and completely irrational. You know what I'm talking about. In the moment, totally feels and sounds and you just absolutely believe it's rational. But then you step away from that moment and time passes. You're like, what the heck was I doing? Why was I thinking that? I was completely beyond. However, at the time, it's hard to tell the difference. And so that's why when we master our minds, we don't allow ourselves to go to those scary places And that's huge for our mental health, obviously most importantly, and therefore for our ability to live on our own. I encourage you to discover the power of meditation and discover a whole new level of living well. And I'll provide a link on the show notes to the benefits of that. Number eight is to become your best friend. Paul Brunton states, solitude is strength. To depend on the presence of the crowd is weakness. The man who needs a mob to nerve him is much more alone than he imagines. Ah, this is so true. This reminds me of a brilliant scene in Huckleberry Finn. We just happened to be reading that just recently. When Colonel Sherburne, written by Mark Twain, as you guys all know, gets up and speaks to this crowd. He says, basically, a mob is a coward's way of functioning in life. If you can't act on your own, in other words, then are you truly living courageously? And I think this is huge. It doesn't mean that you're never going to be around people and you're never going to hang out in groups of people. It just means can you function on your own? And if you can't, why can't you? 
find that courage within you so you can, because as we've said in the other points, the previous points, solitude, being on our own is where we discover so much about ourselves, which gives us so much strength and guidance and peace of mind. When we enjoy our own company, we are better able to set healthy boundaries, speak respectfully to ourselves, and require that others do the same. When we enjoy our own company, we become selective about who we allow into our lives. And in doing so, we begin to welcome quality, supportive, inspired people that elevate the quality of our lives as well as those around us. So number eight, become your best friend. All right, we've gone through eight of the 16 ways to live alone well. I'm gonna take a quick one minute intermission and I will see you on the other side. Welcome back. The eight remaining ways on how to live alone well. We're going right in. Here we go. Number nine, strengthens your relationships. I know you may be thinking, how does living alone actually strengthen relationships? But it does, but it does. But before I get to how and why it works, let me share with you this quote by Albert Gwino. And he says, people who cannot bear to be alone are generally the worst company. And I had to include this because... I I chuckled as soon as I saw it because it's absolutely true, at least in my experience. When I reflect back on those instances when I'm with people that I just can't seem to, I'm not enjoying the experience, it's gone on too long, I'm becoming irritated. If I reflect back on those, in all honesty, the first issue was I wasn't able to communicate clearly what I needed. And that is definitely a fault I will take upon myself. And I would like to think I've improved upon that. But the other is that these people that are clingy, it's often because they don't know how to be alone. And even for, I'm talking even for 10 minutes, 30 minutes, they aren't comfortable functioning or doing something on their own, having to make choices on their own. Nobody wants to be this person. I truly believe that. I don't think anyone wants to be that person that no one wants to be with. In fact, the person doing the clinging may not even realize how off-putting their behavior is. So not only... Are you going to be doing yourself a favor by becoming more comfortable with your own company? But you'll be doing your current and future relationships a favor as well. So number nine, strengthens relationships. Number 10, dive into your passion without apology. Pablo Picasso states, without great solitude, no serious work is possible. What an amazing opportunity it is when we live alone to have the time and space to throw ourselves into our passions without worrying about hurting someone's feelings or spending too much time doing whatever it is our passion requires us to do or having to put any other priorities on top of it. I know without question, if I hadn't been living alone, I would not have started the Simply Luxurious Life blog. Referring back to point number five, when we give ourselves time to explore, we can discover our passions and then have the time to dive in and be our most productive selves. So number 10, dive into your passions unapologetically. Number 11 is the importance of being able to get to know yourself. Quote from Melvin Kinder, solitude can be frightening. Because it invites us to meet a stranger we think we may not want to know ourselves. Now, often we surround ourselves with incessant social noise and events and chatter of others so that we don't have to be alone, so that we don't have to face our fears or to discover 
why we are fearful about certain things. However, often what we fear is a significant indicator that that is exactly what we need to explore. And when, and when we explore, we find our purpose. It is when we filter out the fluff, filter out that noise of life, that we can then get to the truth of discovering what makes us truly content. So number 11, enjoy this time to get to know yourself. Do the homework. It will pay off. Number 12, get to know your neighbors. So whether, whether you live in a house or an apartment complex, befriend at least a few of your neighbors. Being able to simply step outside your door and see a friendly face or say hello or know that someone knows your name gives you a sense of community and it gives you something that you feel you can contribute to as well. Not every neighbor will be someone we should get to know, and we need to be able to discern the difference between those and others. But knowing you have at least one person who knows your name is a very good thing and can help with our comfort level. Number 12, get to know your neighbors. Number 13, craft a schedule. Now, what I mean by this is whether it's your exercise routine or your morning coffee run or tea run, or places you go regularly, try to maybe make a schedule out of them. And the reason for this, and I always think of the the sitcom Cheers. Now, by no means am I condoning this idea of going to a bar every day the entire day. Absolutely not. But they knew him, right? He had his own community. He walks in the door, they say Norm. They know him. Same thing with your coffee shop. There's nothing like this. And I, I actually, on my Instagram account, I posted the post about this whole idea. I walked into my favorite coffee shop, Colville Patisserie in Walla Walla, and I walk in and she just looks at me now, and actually a few of them do, and they know I want my regular. And I love that. And it just makes you feel like you're part of a community. It's a small community and they don't know you intimately usually. In fact, when I walk my dogs on my route, most of the people don't know my name, but they know my dog's names and I know their dog's names. And it's hilarious. I love that. I love that. So this kind of creates a community for yourself when you're doing the things that you would normally do anyway. Now, if the routine isn't working, it's not fostering the quality of life you want, change it up, try something new, and that's completely okay and highly encouraged. But try to get into those routines, include those routines that add a better way of living to your life, a sense of community. Number 13 is craft your schedule. Number 14 Watch television with purpose. Since you are the queen of the remote in your sanctuary, it can be very tempting to watch more than we probably should. And I will admit I watch TV. I share different programs here, right here on the episodes of the podcast, as well as the blog. But the key is to make sure that you watch certain content that is going to foster your life or that unwinds you. Because we all have to watch our reality shows from time to time. Hey, I admit that, right? But make sure you're watching when you generally want to watch. You're not just having background noise. Make sure that you can eliminate as many commercials as possible. They definitely have an effect whether we realize it or not. And consider Netflix. Consider the DVR, as we talked about with regards to getting rid of the commercials, so that you can watch what you want, when you want, and not waste time doing so. And then consider balancing your TV watching with reading, reading a book or enjoying your music, or listening to the radio instead, or a podcast to get your news, so you're not seeing or being bombarded with all these images all the time. The key is to just be aware that you need to master that television. Don't let it master you. Don't use it as a crutch. And I know, I say that only because I speak from my own experience. Before I could master my mind, so much of my TV was simply used as noise, as background to stop my brain from thinking because my brain is constantly going. And since I hadn't figured out how to master it, I had to have a crutch to help me do that. And that's not necessarily bad. It's just that you need to recognize why you're doing it. And you have to recognize the power that that crutch could use or do on your life, on your brain, on your thoughts. So be thinking about that and try to counter that by, if you need some background and from noise or something, make it be your radio or have it be music or have it be that book that you pick up that's a complete lighthearted, pleasant read that will turn off your mind, whatever it is. So number 14, watch television with purpose. In other words, master your television. You can do it. All right, moving on to number 15. Speaking of mastering, master your vices. 
One thing I wholeheartedly love about living alone is being able to stock my refrigerator and my pantry and my shelves with only the food that I love and that I should eat. If there are any crutches to things that I or vices I should not be eating because I can't seem to control myself around them, and we all have certain foods like that, or drinks maybe, then don't bring them into your house. Just don't buy them. Since you don't have to shop for anybody but yourself, don't bring it into your house. Now, some people will say, wait a second, just have self-discipline. Absolutely. I totally agree. But this is the thing. You live in your house every single day. And not every single day are you going to have that same self-discipline. You're going to have days when you're weak. And you're going to have had a bad day. Or you're going to have something happen. You're just really, really hungry. And that may be the only thing that you can reach for because that's all you have left. And then you're going to kick yourself for doing that. Don't have it available. Just don't have it there for those days where you just can't, you just can't bolster up your self-discipline because you don't need to beat yourself up about that. You just don't need to. So this is a way of eliminating unnecessary stress. So number 15, master your vices. Number 16, curate a positive inspired life. A quote from K.T. Young. It is only when we silence the blaring sounds of our daily existence that we can finally hear the whispers of truth that life reveals to us as it stands knocking on the doorsteps of our hearts. When we live alone, we become the standalone artist of our own lives, every single detail. We can choose what to eliminate, what to add, and what to foster into beautiful fruition. Choose the people, the words, the information, the images, the experiences, the destinations carefully and consciously, for they will shape your world and thus the person you become. It's a powerful experience to be able to live and enjoy your home life by yourself, whether it's last a year or the rest of your adult life. I hope you enjoy it because it can be amazing. It doesn't mean you're lonely when you live by yourself. That is a state of mind that can exist whether you are surrounded by a million people or the wrong person in a relationship. Being alone is about knowing yourself, mastering your mind, and really reveling in all of the goodness that it offers. I want to leave you with one last quote And this one is from Ellen Bernstein as she reflects on living alone after being under the assumption that it was something to avoid. She simply says, quote, what a lovely surprise to finally discover how unlonely being alone can be. And I hope you find that too. Thank you very much for tuning in. We still have a petite pleasure that I can't wait to share with you. A few readers have been asking about it on my Instagram, and I'm going to share it with you today. But for any of the links that I mentioned in the podcast or the episode so far, please go to the simplyluxuriouslife.com backslash podcast 33, and you'll find all the quotes, links, and everything we've talked about today. All right, I'm going to take a quick break, and I will see you on the other side with this week's petite pleasure. Welcome back. All right. So today's Petit Pleasure is a book by one of my favorite authors. And I am a super fan of Mr. Peter Mayle. He's a British author. Many of you are readers of him, I know. And he currently resides in Provence, France. Oh, what a life. I would love to be a fly on that wall. I um, thought I had read all of his books. I've read a lot of them. And I was so tickled when I found out I hadn't. I was with a friend over uh, the holidays during the winter break and they mentioned, hey, have you read his book, Acquired Tastes? And I was like, no, huh? what's it about? Well, it is his third book and it was, so it was written back in 1993 and it is ideal for evening reading as it's a compilation of his articles that when he used to write for GQ that um, they've just put into a compilation into one book. There is one article from Esquire. It's actually the first chapter, but everything else is from GQ. And each chapter is only about four to six pages long. And it brings 
he brings the reader along for these excursions of how basically the other half live. And from living with servants to having your shoes custom made, Mail simply takes a peek into these pleasures of decadent living at its finest. Along the way, much is learned as well, such as precisely how to hunt for truffles and why cashmere is certainly worth investing in. This book will definitely be a wonderful evening read and will ensure pleasant dreams. I highly recommend. In fact, my friend mentioned that she loves to read this book while she's in the bathtub. Just one of the chapters. She just totally luxuriates in the moment of the book in the bath, and that just sounds lovely. So I think you'll like it. I think you'll like it. Peter Mayles Acquired Tastes, and there'll be a link on today's show notes, podcast 33. Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. For more ideas and inspiration throughout the week, stop by the blog, the Simply Luxurious Life. Dot com or pick up the book choosing the simply luxurious life a modern woman's guide until next monday i'm your host shannon abels bonjour